word that I use isn't agitation, although you could probably describe agitation as being subtle or gross, uh, but um, distractions. And by distraction, I mean any thought or feeling or sensation other than the uh, chosen meditation object. That's a distraction. So you've got the one chosen meditation object and anything else is automatically... Anything else that you are consciously aware of belongs in the category of distractions by comparison with that. And when we say that they're subtle, we mean that our primary focus is on the meditation object, but we are still aware of these other distractions in the background and the periphery of our awareness. And that's the sense in which they are subtle. They are there, but uh, the, the, the attention is still primarily on the meditation object. But when, as so often happens, one of those displaces the meditation object so that now that's the primary object and you're still aware of the sensations of the breath, but much less so because they sort of slipped into a subsidiary degree of awareness. Now they're in the background, not lost, not forgotten, but they're no longer at the focal point. That's why you're still at level four and not slip back to level three, because you still have some awareness That's of the right. object. It's not completely yeah. gone. If you forget, if you forget the meditation object and you completely lose awareness of it, then that's the problem that you were kept encountering at level three. Mm-hmm. And so, in level four, you don't lose the meditation object, or at least very rarely you lose the meditation object, but you have this constant shifting where sometimes one of those distractions uh, ceases to be subtle and becomes gross. And to describe what that feels like, and everyone has experienced this, you're aware of the meditation object. And there are a variety of these subtle distractions present sort of coming and going. They're in your awareness, but you haven't lost the meditation object. And they may be gross or they may be subtle, but uh, you haven't (coughs) lost the meditation object. These, uh, the other thing that varies uh, when you're doing uh, stage four practice is the, uh, how, how strong and how frequent these distractions are that arise. So sometimes they, you know, there's just there's a constant barrage of them, and that's a mind that is in a state of agitation. It's like it just can't stop feeding uh, various thoughts and feelings and memories and images, and it's like you're constantly struggling not to be overwhelmed by those. But then there's other times where the mind is much calmer, <coughs> and there are still distractions present, but uh, the, the, the thoughts are coming more slowly and the uh, distractions in the form of sensation uh, are less intrusive and, uh, and not so many in number. So I think you've all experienced that at some, some you know, probably many different times. So in stage four practice, that's the way it is the whole time. And what you're doing is you're learning to deal with the presence of these distractions without letting them take over. And you've mastered that stage when uh, you can do that, that you, you, you never have subtle distractions becoming gross distractions. They stay in the category of subtle distractions. And generally, by the time you've done that, they tend to be, you know, they, they, they've slowed down somewhat and they're, and, uh, the, the, they're not just gushing forth in, in large numbers. But the most important thing is that you've trained your mind so that um, you're relatively stable in your attention to the uh, 
uh, breath. And of course, the fact that you're aware of these other things means that you're not perfectly stable. But in terms of the feel of it, it feels it doesn't feel like your mind is really moving away of these things. You're just aware of them at the same time, and they're in the background. That's a level six. You're just well, that's now that would be that's at level. level that would be a level five. When you've mastered level four, the mastery of level four and 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 the kind of practice in level five is where the subtle distractions just they they don't succeed in becoming gross distractions. And that allows you then to focus in on level five in the subtle dullness, becoming aware of it and correcting for it. And once you've done that, when you get to stage six, what you want to do is uh, you want to become (coughs) much more single-pointed and much more exclusively focused so that these subtle distractions uh, virtually disappear. They don't completely disappear. Because there will still be the occasional thought, you know. Um, well, when you're in level six, they're there, they're going. What you're trying to get to in stage seven is where uh, you're relatively single-pointed and <coughs> there are just occasion. There's the occasional thought. There's the occasional louder or more unusual noise that you actually become aware of. But most sounds you're not aware of at all. There's the occasional bodily sensation that you're aware of, but most bodily sensation you're not aware of at all. And they're, they're very much in the distant background, and most of the time there's nothing there. That's, that's what it's like at stage seven. It's single-pointed. Um, to, to clarify this, it's single-pointed in the sense that whatever you've taken as a, as a deliberately intended object of your concentration or the object of your attention, that that's held firmly. There's not a wavering. And it's exclusive focus in the sense that uh, now even when you're steadily attending to the sensations of the breath, and you may have noticed this, your mind is, is it's taking in those subtle distractions. And in a way, it's as though the scope of your awareness kind of expands and contracts. And you know, if there begins to be an increase in background noise, you kind of, the scope of your awareness sort of expands. So it's taking that in, even though you're staying focused. So that's, uh, that's what you're trying to overcome. You're trying to keep... Uh, not only directionally steady, you know, aimed at the sensations, but also not this sort of expanding so it takes in other things as well. So what it feels like to be at stage six is what it feels like to be when you've mastered stage four and you're in stage five with regard to the distractions. In other words, there's, there is a pretty... Uh, steady stream of uh, subtle distraction of one form or another, but uh, you have no difficulty uh, sustaining your attention on the meditation object as your primary focus. And your objective is really to narrow down that focus and become even more steady so that even those very quick and very subtle uh, uh, movements of the attention that, that pick up the subtle distractions cease. That's that's what you're trying to accomplish in stage six. And so, um, and and there's various things that you can do to assist in that process, uh, but uh, it can be accomplished just simply through sustaining your attention on the meditation object as unwaveringly as possible. And what you'll find is that over time, just by doing this, the, it, the stability, the steadiness increases. At the same time, you'll find over time that the number of thoughts and the uh, intensity of your awareness of thoughts decreases. And you'll come to the point where, you know, there are thoughts there, but they're just like a faint whisper in the background. 
Well, what you'll actually experience is an increasing number of periods uh, of varying length where that's the case. You're sitting there and practicing, and and you know there's thoughts coming and going, and you're just remaining focused. And then they'll kind of fade away, and you'll enjoy a period where you know you're you're very aware of of the sensations of the breath. The breath is usually very calm and very slow, and that you know, there's only every now and then it'll be the faintest thought, like a whisper in the background. And your body will feel very stable, very comfortable, and every now and then there may be uh, some awareness of a sensation. But in general, most of your the usual awareness you have is the aches and pains and the stiff spots and the pressure on your you know, knees or your ankles or so forth. Uh, you're not aware of it. It's not gone, but you're, you're just not aware of it. Because you are more aware of the meditation object, the same way that uh, at at any time, you know, you can direct your attention to some uh, some part of your body that you hadn't been paying attention to before. And you discover all those sensations were there, but a moment ago you weren't aware of them at all because you were focused on something else. Or while you're listening to me, you may not be aware of the sensations on the sole of your right foot, but if you direct your attention to it, poof, there they are. So this is the sort of thing that you come to, is that your mind is steady enough that you're, you're just simply not attending to those sensations. And as a result of that, those parts of your mind that tend to want to draw your attention to those sensations cease to do, to, do so. And those parts of your mind that keep generating thoughts that, you know, uh, that you know, it, it's very much as though there's, it's a part of your mind. Its job is to think thoughts. And uh, it tries to come up th- with thoughts that are interesting enough that you will pay attention to them. And, and, you know, and if you persist in ignoring that part of you, if you persist in ignoring the thoughts long enough, that part of your mind gets tired of doing this and it just kind of, you know, stops. <laughs> And when <clears throat> when you have very long periods consisting, you know, of a substantial part of your uh, of a period of your meditation practice, where uh, you have very clear awareness of the sensations of the breath, and only very occasional awareness of other uh, distractions, and when they're there, you really feel that they don't have the power to to draw your mind. There's, there's, you, you know they're there, but they don't draw your mind. Then, then you've mastered the sixth stage, and you're in the seventh stage. Now, what? You, while you're in the seventh stage, what characterizes that more than anything else is the fact that you have to remain vigilant. If you relax your vigilance, then the these subtle distractions will increase in frequency and intensity. And you'll, you know, and uh, depending on how far that you let it go, you eventually lose your concentration entirely. But what characterizes the seventh stage is it takes continued vigilance and constant correction to sustain this single pointed, uh, exclusive focus. What you're after is this is the final, you know perfection of the training of the mind and attentional stability, the point where it becomes effortless. And that's where you've reached the eighth stage, where you where in, in terms of concentration, it's effortless. Um, I think that what happens in this transition from the sixth through the seventh through the eighth stages is what uh, can be uh, very usefully understood in the term unification of mind. By the time you get to this stage in your meditation, it will be very clear to you that mind is a vague term that encompasses a huge number of mental processes functioning more or less interdependently yet autonomously and often in conflict with each other. 
you know, uh, and and you know that as soon as you started meditating, there's there's one one of your minds said we're going to meditate, another of your minds says no, let's do something more interesting, <laughs> yeah. and usually three or four of them had different ideas of what would be more interesting, and so there's this very obvious non-unification of mind present. The subtle distractions in the sixth stage are the manifestation of this non-unification. There is one part of mind that is clearly dominant in sustaining the attention on the meditation object. But there are all these other aspects of mind that are still competing for attention. So there's very much uh, a need of greater unification. Now, the process through the seventh and the eighth stages is basically where all these different other mental processes start to come online, you know, and to get with the program of what we're doing in the moment. And so there ceases to be this tendency of the different parts of your mind to be going in different directions. And when when there is uh, this kind of unification of mind, then uh, concentration and awareness become effortless to sustain. But the other interesting thing that happens is that there's a lot of joy and happiness that arises in association with that. This is not a unique to meditation phenomenon, although in meditation it happens in a way that is quite unusual compared to ordinary experience. But if you consider any time you have a unification of mind towards a single goal and a single activity, you experience a lot of joy and pleasure and happiness and inner calm. This is the reason that people do hobbies. They allow themselves to become engrossed in something. Uh, uh, There is a a psychologist. uh, His name is Dr. Uh, Csikszentmihalyi. And he has studied this phenomenon at length. He calls it flow. And he's interviewed many people, uh, like very often surgeons, uh, go into the state of flow when they're in surgery. They are just, they're totally focused on one thing. And they say it's the most enjoyable thing that they do. And well, he's interviewed all kinds of people, uh, you know, even uh, assembly line workers in factories who say they get into this state of, of single mindedness and uh, they are just suffused with pleasure and happiness and they just love doing it. And so I think that this is basically when the constant agitation of the mind that in, in its entirety that is a consequence of all of these different parts of the mind uh, trying to you know, do their own thing and going different directions, whenever they all coalesce into a unity, then the state of the mind is not only calm, but also joyful. And uh, in a sense, you might describe that as being the, the natural state of the non-agitated mind. You know. uh, and I think the unfortunate thing is as we go from childhood to becoming adults and we take on all these responsibilities and concerns and plans and worries and judgments and everything else, what we've done is we've populated the inside of our head with all of these different motive forces trying to go in all these different directions and the result is tremendous turbulence and it's a wonder that we're ever happy at all. <laughs> so, But anyway, back to what I was saying. So this, the transition from stage six to seven to eight is a progressive unification of mind. Single pointed concentration unifies the mind. Once you've achieved unification of mind, you don't necessarily need to continue single-pointedly from from that time. You can continue, and you haven't really completed the full development of shamatha. To complete the full development of shamatha, you continue 
single-pointedly. You let the uh, the joy and happiness, the piti and sukha. Uh, I'm not exactly sure of the pronunciation of the Sanskrit equivalent of, of piti. When I see it written, it's p r dot t i. I don't know. Anybody know how you pronounce it? Priti. Priti. Okay. That's the Sanskrit equivalent. Literally, in Pali, it means joy. And it is uh, carefully defined as a state of mind to distinguish it from happiness, which is sukha. Well, sukha actually has two connotations. Uh, Pleasure, in the sense of bodily pleasure, and happiness. So uh, they... Just sukha sukha is body, bodily pleasure, and uh, so manasa sukha is mental happiness, mental pleasure or happiness, and so there's this distinction made between piti, which is joy and is a mental state, and the bodily and mental pleasure that accompany it. But when you come into the state of unification of mind, the joy arises, the piti arises, and it's company, accompanied by bodily pleasure and mental happiness. And at first they're very intense, and this piti is accompanied by tremendous amount of energy movement, which is often, very often, experienced physically in the body. And uh, although the word means joy, and it ultimately is joyful and happy. Initially, it can actually be unpleasant when these energy movements and strange sensations and things like this come up. So in the eighth stage, when you've achieved this unification of mind, the piti develops. But in the development of the piti, you may experience shocks running up your spine, tingling on your skin and chills and shaking and your body twitching and jerking or rocking back and forth without you intending it to and things like this. But eventually it will mature into the the physical component of your body will become very, very relaxed and stable and and actually feel as though it's just an an empty shell and be completely perfused with uh, or suffused with a, a sense of pleasure. Uh, that really isn't a pleasure of the senses. It's not the same kind of pleasure, say, you know, uh, a tub of warm water or something like that, or somebody stroking your skin with a ostrich feather. It's it's it is it, it's more subtle and it's more internal, you know. But it's it's it is located uh, in in the body, or at least in the mental body, and. Uh, and there's a distinct mental pleasure or happiness. And this has an agitation and excitement to it, and um, which often interrupts the meditation process. So you, in the eighth stage, you, uh, with this unification of mind, you allow the full development of the piti, uh, and the sukha and the ninth stage you become familiar with it and it loses its intensity and it subsides in intensity it takes on much more quality of tranquility and at the same time uh, there is an equanimity towards uh, well and it's quite understandable when you have when you have such a, a wonderful source of inner satisfaction available you cease to react so strongly to external things, and so you have a considerable equanimity. And it's with that combination of, uh, of the unified mind, uh, the piti and the sukha, and the tranquility and the equanimity that you have, uh, that's the completion of shamatha. That's really the definition of shamatha. So that when you get to the eighth stage, as I say, you don't need to continue in single-pointedness. But the advantage of continuing in single-pointedness is the complete development of shamatha, which then, of course, can be continued to into the absorptions, the dhyanas. But from once you have that 
that unification of mind and the, the beginning of the development of piti, then you can also undertake a variety of all kinds of other practices. It's a very good basis for developing uh, uh, insight, vipassana. So. I did go beyond the six, fourth and sixth stages, <laughs> what you asked about. Okay. Well, what about this place that sometimes happens when I'm I'm having my I'm I'm doing the breath and with the breath and then all of a sudden I just feel this big open space. My head just opens up to a big space, mm-hmm. and I don't have any any thoughts. Mm-hmm. But is that a distraction? No, no, no. If there's no thoughts, there is. Uh, is there anything in that experience that you would describe as a distraction? No, because it's like nothing. Mm-hmm. It, 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 and sometimes it's like I'm standing someplace that's scary, you know, like mm-hmm. a big unknown thing or something like that. Yeah. Uh, what what are you aware of in that time? What is what is the object of your attention? It seems to me and I've tried to think of that. I think I'm still feel the breath. I mean, I think mm-hmm. the breath part is still there, but <clears throat> there's nothing else in my <clears throat> Awareness. Mm-hmm. It doesn't last for a long time, but um, I, I didn't know if. I, and and sometimes then it it goes into lights and colors mm-hmm. and things like that. From there, would would you describe in that say that you are you are still aware of the breath, but more than that, you're just aware of being aware. You're just conscious of being conscious and. I'm I'm more um, interested in this big space and what what it's going to be doing, or if it's going to be doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> or it's going to be doing. Okay, yeah. So I I, I thought maybe that would be considered a, dis- a distraction that I well, should pull back from. In actually, in terms of uh, in terms of of the continued development of shamatha, it is a distraction. Uh, you're looking. At, you're waiting for something interesting to happen and fill the space. But if you just bring your attention, continue to be aware of the breath, and let that big space be there. That would that is, is the way to to deal with that. So that is a distraction in that sense. Yeah. But that's a, that's a very refined distraction. Yeah. And, uh, so essentially, at that point, you know, the, the, can you appreciate the degree of Unification of mind that is there, you know, like the, the, there's no other parts of your mind tossing stuff up, right? Saying, right. Hey, look at this, yeah, it feels good that way because there's no yeah. nothing, mm-hmm. nothing happening, nothing, no, yeah. no thoughts, yeah. So, if you were to, when that happens, uh, the best thing is to just. Continue the practice, and it, just with that state of expectancy, or of, of curiosity. Well, let's see where this develops. But I'll just keep my attention. I, I'll continue to do what brought this about, because if you cease to do what brought this about, it will break up and disappear. Mm-hmm. <coughs> so, yeah, the lights. The other thing, the experience of lights that you mentioned. Uh, a lot of people have that, and that can become. Uh, a very consistent part of your practice experience. You know, when you reach this level of uh, concentration and unification of mind, that you, that you experience a, uh, often begins as a single bright light, but it ultimately evolves into this all-pervading light that just seems to fill. You know, your eyes are closed, but you seem to be in this inner space. It's completely filled. With light. Sometimes it's that way, but other times it's like colored mandalas that mm-hmm. 
open and close and shift. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's 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 uh, another way that uh, that often manifests. Yeah. And I just you see, I just usually refer to all of this as just the illumination phenomenon. You know, the, the light phenomenon. It's, uh, it takes many forms, uh, and uh, in, in, in different people, but it's a very common part of the practice. And there are some practices that take the light and make it. They shift the object to that, you know, and then make it a primary object. And uh, one way of doing jhana practice, the absorptions, is whenever the light comes, then you take the light and you take that as your meditation object and you bring it up to uh, a, a great intensity and then you uh, absorb, uh, you allow your attention to become fully absorbed into it and enter jhanas that way. Uh, and there, well, there's the sound and light meditations too, which it's basically a samatha practice. You get to the point that there is an inner sound that also, some of you may have accompanied this, but when there is... Uh, uh, this degree of concentration, it's very common for people to experience a sound like a ringing or a buzzing or sometimes a musical sound. Uh, and so uh, sound and light meditations are based on developing concentration until the sound and the light phenomena arise and then making them the primary object of the meditation thereafter. Yes? So what if those sounds are light and lights are coming before you actually can reach any of these high levels on your breath? Yeah, they, they come periodically, unexpectedly. Um, when we talk about these stages, we're talking about <coughs> what you can, if you consistently can create the conditions for to enter into that particular state, then you're at that stage. But at almost any stage, you can have periods where your mind just slips into the right space for that to happen. So that you'll have the light experience arise, or you'll have the sound experience. Or there's uh, another uh, common one is a bo- one involving bodily sensation, which I did allude to a little bit. Your body feels as though it's empty and very light, sometimes feels as though it's just is, is floating off uh, the, you know, like you're levitating. Um, and as a part of that, it's not unusual to feel that your body is in a position that you know it can't be. Well, a, and a subtle form of this that comes, uh, that, that's quite common uh, long before you've developed deep concentration is you, you'll be actually concentrating better than you think and you have the sensation you'll feel like you're about to fall over and then if you if you check if you open your eyes and check you've you've shifted maybe a quarter of an inch at the absolute most (laughs) but uh, you know you'll have that feeling but when it becomes really strong you can feel like your body's in in, uh, a completely different position than it is including standing up. You're sitting there cross-legged and you feel like you're standing up. You know, and you, you you can explore the sensation of your body and examine this, you know, with this, how can this be? I feel like I'm standing up and I know I'm sitting down. And of course, it'll sort of disintegrate and then you'll find yourself back sitting again. But these are all, all of these things are... Um, Parts of concomitants of the development of PT when the mind is, is is fully concentrated and unified, but they can occur individually uh, or in combinations of one or two for brief periods of time, uh, 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 long long before you've achieved uh, any sort of sustained level of concentration like that. But they're they're wonderful indicators of the kinds of things unusual things you have to look forward to. The downside of it is you can say, oh, wow, that was great. I want that to happen again. <laughs> you know, and, and you just can't make it happen again. All you can do is keep working to create the conditions where you know, the, it will consistently arise. Yeah. 
So, um, I'm trying to think of how to say it. If I've had this experience several times lately, and um, I'll be going along and kind of like really obviously distracted and feeling like nothing's shifting. And then um, lately, the last time it happened, um, I, w I just decided I was I shifted my focus from the breath to some bodily sensation because it was really taking my attention. And then I'll shift. This has happened a few times. I'll shift really quickly into a place, a very different state where I'm completely focused on the breath. Mm -hmm. There's almost no distraction. I'm very very aware, like really bright. Mm -hmm. And it's so the contrast to to like it seems like it's it's a quick shift mm -hmm. and then um and then there's a bit of curiosity like what's gonna happen next, but I don't like. I'm getting better at staying, like staying with the breath. Just like I feel like I like the like there is no body there. I'm just breathing, you know, like this breath thing. That's all there really is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, when that happens, then is it? I don't know how to keep to sustain it um, for very long. I'm not really sure how long I've done. It, how long? I mean, probably not that long. But maybe mm -hmm. it's getting longer. I think. Mm -hmm. But is there anything? to do, like, and why does it shift so, like, it, it seems like I don't have any idea it's coming. It would be cool if I, if it were sort of a stepwise thing and, <laughs> you know, but yeah. it doesn't seem like that, but it, it just happens kind of quickly. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't scare me anymore. But. Well, that's good, yes. Don't be scared of it. I, so this, this is... What you're having is experiences that uh, correspond to, uh, well, let me put this up. You're having temporarily the kind of experiences that you want to be able to have consistently mm -hmm. all the time, and that's what you're saying. H how, can, how can I do that, and how can I sustain that? And it's by, you know, it's by training your mind. It's by creating the conditions for that to happen. And... Uh, it, uh, if you keep on practicing the way that you are, if you keep on practicing in, in the right way, then that's what you come to. So you, you'll you'll come to that place where uh, it happens more often, it happens more easily, and also you'll come to the place of understanding exactly what it is. Like at this moment, your mind's very distracted, and then you become very focused. And you're not sure exactly what's responsible for that transition. Mm -hmm. But as you continue to practice, you, you will come to understand what's responsible, specifically what's responsible for that, and you'll be able to create that, to create the conditions for that. Mm -hmm. So not to get, you know, you, you said, how can I make this happen? How can I sustain it? And don't get into pursuing those experiences, right, right. but continue doing what you have been doing, which has caused them to occur. Okay. And, and that's that's the answer, rather than changing anything to try to pursue them. Yeah. Do you find that there's a difference in your meditations depending on which direction you face? I have not noticed that, uh, at, at least in terms of the cardinal directions, no. Um, you know, when I, I sit in a different place in the room, it feels different, but it uh, it will come to be the same after a little while. I'm curious why you ask. Because uh, in our tradition, they uh, they recommend that you face west, and every other tradition. <laughs> has always said face east, and I actually do better facing north. <laughs> I've never tried facing south. I think I might explode. <laughs> I just wondered what, you know, experience has been. <laughs> well. <laughs> All such 
notions are fabrications of the mind. And uh, <laughs> if your mind attaches to them, then you'll experience them strongly, and otherwise you won't. But ultimately, they're, they're all empty, and it doesn't make any difference. So there, there, is, I, there is no such thing as direction, really. <laughs> Yes, please. <clears throat> you spoke yesterday a little bit about recognizing thoughts when it's arising and increasing the mind's energy. I wonder if you could review some of those techniques. For increasing the energy of the mind. Yeah. Well, yes. I usually begin with the, the, the simplest remedies for the mildest dullness. I was just reflecting, I wonder if there's any value in approaching it from a different direction, but no, I think we'll stay with that. Okay. Uh, there is just a basic principle that the more quickly you become aware of dullness, the, the, the milder the dullness is, the easier it is to uh, correct it and the easier it is to keep from slipping back into it. So usually what happens though is um, as our practice develops, we only become aware of dullness when it's very strong. But then after a while we start to recognize the onset of dullness when it's not so strong. So. Uh, and that's the reason I was reflecting on this, because if I do as I always do and start with the, how you correct for the mildest form of dullness, and then if that doesn't work, and then if that doesn't work, and then if that doesn't work, doesn't truly reflect the experience of the meditator when they begin encountering dullness. Because uh, they're going to encounter the stronger forms of dullness, which uh, are most difficult to bring themselves out of, and which they very quickly find themselves sinking, sinking back into and require the stronger remedies for. Um, but but uh, they can, and sometimes very quickly, begin to recognize the onset of dullness in its mildest stages and, and use, the, uh, use the mildest remedies for it. So with that in mind, I will go ahead and the, and start with the mildest form of dullness. So you're observing the sensations of your breath and there is a degree of vividness and clarity to that observation that uh, you recognize as, as, as being your alert state, at least at the stage of development of mindful awareness that you have. and. If you if you are sufficiently aware, you'll notice when that begins when it begins to lose that vividness, and it becomes more vague. And you know it, it's where when you're fully engaged with the breath, if this breath is different than the last one, a little deeper, a little shorter, or longer, or you know if, if there's a difference, you're aware of it. Not that you're jumping on that difference or that you're, you know, thinking discursively about it, but you notice you notice that there's a difference. So this sort of illustrates, uh, I, I think, when when you are fully aware of the breath, as your mind begins to be dull, it's this familiar repetition of the sensations, and so you're not really as if if this breath is different than the last one, you're not really as aware of that. And the the sensations themselves are becoming more vague and sort of sort of more distant as though you're you know what I'm saying? Okay. Now that's that's subtle dullness. And at that point, usually you can correct it just by recognizing it and just going in and, and to to cap recapture that vividness. To bring to bring those uh, sensations, you know, into, into full awareness, 
and to be in the flow of it because you know it is a flowing process and your awareness of the difference from one breath to the next uh, comes from you know it's sort of like you're riding the crest of the wave all the way and you're never quite losing it you're, you're staying with it and, and so you know when it changes you know and I know you've heard the, uh, the sutta uh, quote uh, when he breathes in long he knows he breathes in long when he breathes out long he knows he breathes out long and so forth and that's really it's that quality of really being with the uh, uh, the sensations of the breath so when you're losing that very often you just go back to recover what you've lost and that takes care of the dullness now when dullness is a bit stronger there's more of a distance and more of a vagueness there and uh, actually there there may even be the beginning of some gaps in the awareness what's happening at that point is your your mind is starting the, the energy level of your mind is starting to fall it's starting to sink and so what you need to do is to bring the energy level of the mind back up again what normally sustains our level of alertness is the constant stimulation we're hearing and we're seeing and we're feeling and we're thinking uh, and, and we're often doing as well. So there is a, a constant input of a whole variety of kinds of stimulation that keeps the energy level of the mind high. But if you've been sitting, you know, if you're 30 minutes into a sit and the mind's been turned inward to just this one sensation, it's inevitable that with the absence of all that stimulation that now the energy level of the mind begins to fall. One very simple way of bringing the energy level back up is just increasing the amount of stimulation that your brain is getting. So uh, you, that can happen with uh, opening your eyes, but sometimes you don't even need to do that. All you need to do is, is when you recognize this, is to expand the scope of your awareness. And instead of being so so tightly focused on the sensations at the at the opening of the nostrils, just become aware of your whole body. A, a little bit stronger version of the same antidote is to not only become aware of the sensations in your whole body, but become aware of the ambient sounds and of the mental sense of the space that you're in. <coughs> you know, with, without abandoning the sensations of the breath, it's just expanding the scope. And then, when you've brought yourself back to a state of alertness, then you can bring your attention back to the breath again. Uh, meditating with your eyes open is a way of sort of sustaining that if you find that you keep slipping out of it. Uh, as if you find that that's not sufficient and you need something that's a little bit stronger, then there is taking a, deep, a series of deep breaths and those deep breaths will sort of reinvigorate you. Uh, and especially if uh, you have to be careful about doing this in group settings so you don't uh, you know, make a disturbance for other people. But if you take a deep breath and then you release it slowly against pursed lips, then this, you know, often you'll just have this feeling of you just wake right up and you'll become very bright. And uh, another method is clenching all of your muscles and holding them for you know 10 seconds or so, and then releasing them all completely and repeating that a few times. That will wake you up. What these are all doing is they're, they're stimulating your nervous system. You know, you clench your muscles and that stimulates your whole brain and it elevates the energy level uh, of, of your mind. Then... When that is not sufficient, then you might have to resort to some really strong remedies with sleepiness. If you keep, uh, if you keep just falling asleep or almost falling asleep, and then you bring yourself back out of it using these other things, but you find that uh, very quickly, almost immediately, you just feel you're being sucked back into the stillness. Then it's probably a good idea to stand up. You can try meditating standing up for a little while. Uh, meditating, sta as, as you know, meditating standing up for very long can, uh, can produce a lot of 
uh, discomfort in the body. But uh, if you meditate standing up long enough to overcome that dullness, then you can try sitting again. You can also switch to walking meditation. And uh, uh, the, the next to the most extreme result, or, uh, resort is to uh, go splash some cold water in your face. And then if that doesn't work, you probably need to go have a nap. <laughs> <laughs> Well, one other thing, too, I think it was Garshan Rinpoche who said, PET! Yeah. <laughs> if you're by yourself. If you're by yourself. <laughs> right. Yeah, and that's saying the same thing. You know, it's, uh, uh, you, you can make up your own if you recognize the principle is just, you know, you're stimulating your brain and your mind. And then uh, as soon as you've done that, you just go back to, to the practice. Um, but what you're really looking for is that uh, um, y- you may have to keep bringing yourself out of dullness over and over again, but there'll be that time when you do it and all of a sudden you're wide awake and fully alert and you don't have any problem from that point. And it's by repeating that experience. In other words, to get past dullness once and for all, you have to have a sufficient number of meditation sits where you're working with dullness and you get to that point where you succeeded in bringing your mind to that state of alert wakefulness. So each time each time you're able to do that, uh, you know you're, you're doing the work that's going to bring you beyond dullness once and for all. And one thing that I, I I think I already mentioned this to you. Coming out of dullness is painful. Dullness is pleasant, and pulling yourself out of it is just plain painful, right? And combine that with feelings of frustration and thoughts like, oh, my meditation sits being ruined by this dullness, or uh, you know, what's the matter with me? I just, you know, I keep having this happen to me. All of those kinds of thoughts are there. They're absolute poison. You know, you've got to approach dullness like you do everything else. Oh, good! I've got a chance to work with dullness. <laughs> this is this is going to get me closer to being done with dullness once and for all. You know, and you know when you have dullness and you work with it and, and you have that experience of coming out of it, uh, you know, appreciate that. But the next time it happens, if you don't succeed in doing that, don't don't turn it into a negative. You know, you're still you're still doing the work. You still keep bringing yourself out of dullness over and over again, as often as you need to. You're training the mind. Your mind, all these unconscious processes that are responsible for things like dullness arising, and you can't you have no con- you have no direct control over them. You can't access them. You can't control them directly. You know they're operating on their own. But you can influence them, and you can train them over time. And that's what this is all about: is is training the mind. Good question. Thank you. One thing that I haven't, this is a very short retreat and there's not an opportunity to talk about everything. And I feel like I really want to give you everything and it's absolutely impossible. Uh, But something I I want to just address a little bit, uh, just food for future thought and exploration and conversation, is that very often there's a tendency to make a distinction between a samatha or concentration practice and an insight or vipassana practice. But they really shouldn't, they, they don't need to be separate and they shouldn't be regarded as, as being separate. And in this practice that you're doing, there is an enormous opportunity for cultivating very deep insight. Um, the 
as I'm sure you're all aware, really the first stage in insight is uh, the cultivation of right view, the purification of view, which means recognizing that our normal way of conceiving of there being a world of substantial objects and a separate self is a mind-created illusion. And the idea that we are a body and a mind and somehow in there is this substantial self is an illusion. What, what you can recognize intellectually, but see, in this practice, insight is experiential. It's not analytical, it's experiential. But it's really helpful to have the intellectual understanding so you know, so that you recognize the experience when you're having it. So, in the purification of view, you come to the understanding that what you are, what the totality of what you are, your entire existence consists of a sequence of conscious experiences. And all of this other stuff are ideas and concepts generated by the mind as a result of that. Now you can, it's easy to recognize, well, that's true, you know, I, uh, I hear and then I see and then I think and then I conceptualize and then I formulate an intention and then uh, I experience the sensations as, say, my arm reaches out and grasps something, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And you can you can recognize, in fact, that yeah, that's true. My whole life has been a sequence of conscious experiences, consciousness taking different objects, and uh, another object of consciousness is intention that arises, the intention to do things, and then if I'm lucky, that triggers a sequence of uh, sensations that correspond to the desired result, but sometimes it produces a different <laughs> sequence of sensations <laughs> and the desire is frustrated. But yes, that's all my life is, is a sequence of conscious experiences. Knowing that is one thing. When you sit down and you're meditating like this, that's working. <laughs> and and you're, you're like this with your eyes closed. Your eyes are such a big part of creating this appearance of reality. And when you're sitting like this, it's a lot easier to start realizing that, hey, yeah, that's just one, one experience after another. And what the experience consists of, well, consciousness, I've already mentioned that, are conscious experiences, but consciousness has an object in each experience. And what does it consist of? Well, two general types. It's either a sensation from one of the five physical senses, or else it's some kind of mental object, a thought or an image or a memory or an emotion or a feeling. And so you can start to have, you can start to have the experiential insight into the, the true nature of what you, what you are, a sequence of conscious experiences. And then, of course, you, you're trying to observe the sensations at the tip of your nose, and there's these other distractions. And if you examine those distractions, you can discover, you can satisfy yourself that when uh, the Buddha said there's nothing to you other than these five uh, aggregates, that indeed ev- every object that arises in your mind you know, uh, is fully accounted for, Every one of these conscious experiences is fully accounted for by those five aggregates. You know. And then, also, as you go into this meditation, um, and, and this, is, this is an important part of it, that we say the sensation of the breath. The object is the sensation of the breath. And then it becomes more and more obvious that breath is a concept. The only reality is the sensation. You know, nose is a concept. And air is a concept. And so we start to realize that this term, rupa, rupa is nothing but sensations. And nama is the concepts 
the stories our mind makes up to account for the sensations. You know, and if our mind does a good job, then it, it elaborates a world that accounts for sensations so well that, to a certain degree, we can manipulate our future sensations. But in doing shamatha practice, uh, you know, if you're focusing in very carefully on the sensations at the tip of your nose and you're, you're looking at those sensations more and more closely, what will sometimes happen? This is something that would usually happen about stage seven in the practice, is that you'll, you'll lose the conceptualization. You won't be able to distinguish an in-breath from an out-breath because that's just a concept. All there is is the flow of sensation. And you're, you're examining those sensations and you see that there's, there's the different modalities. There's this pressure and movement, and touch and coolness and warmth and so on and so forth. But as you go into the deeper and deeper, even that you realize is, is something that your mind has put on this. And the sensation you experience is just a vibration. And uh, you, you start experiencing, having the raw experience of, of, of pure rupa. What will happen is your mind, it's like, uh, you know, it's like uh, touching a hot stove. Your mind jumps back from that to the familiar territory of, where's the pattern? Where's the pattern in this? Ah, the familiar pattern. And there's a sense of security. But what out of a continuous flow of sensation with no real differentiation in it at all, your mind extracts repeated patterns, puts labels on them, and creates a world out of them. So you are experiencing, you're experiencing impermanence when you experience that, that, that flow of sensation. And you're having a direct insight into nature of, of uh, impermanence. And then when you discover the way your mind creates concepts from that flow of, uh, of sensation, then you're seeing the, the emptiness of it. It's, you see, the, the most real thing is that flow of sensation, and it doesn't contain intrinsically or inherently these things that we put into it. And you catch, in that way, you kind of catch your mind in the act of making it, its projections. So this is one of the things that, that if you know that it's there to be discovered, can be discovered. It's the kind of insight that's there. Another one is that just in the process of meditating, you're going to have those times where you are so fully engaged with your meditation object that there is no sense of, uh, of self in the way that you usually have it. That can easily go unnoticed. As a matter of fact, everybody has that even when they don't meditate. They get engrossed in a movie and they forget themselves or something like that. But it doesn't occur to people the significance of that. In meditation, though, you can grasp the full significance of that, and you can contrast it with those experiences where you're aware of self. And what comes to mind is self is just another one of these mental objects. And it's completely optional. You can either take self as an object, or you cannot take self as an object. And you start to recognize the emptiness of self. And uh, you, you can sort of distinguish what self really is. It's a feeling. Well, self is a concept. Self is a feeling. A lot of times self is a concept that we generate not particularly consciously. It's a very complicated concept. But when, when you start to strip it down and the conceptual part goes away, what you discover underneath that is self is just a feeling that's generated by, all feelings are generated by the mind. Happiness, suffering, fear, they're just products of the mind. The mind makes feelings. You stimulate the brain with an electrical electrode and a feeling pops up. And you discover that self is just another feeling that's created by the mind. So these are some of the, these are some of the insight aspects to shamatha practice that they're there all the time. All you need to do is know that they're there to be discovered and be open to discovering them. And the power of this practice is that you're going to spend so much time observing your mind as you attempt to train it and as you see all of the different 
things that your mind does, as you discover the nature of the mind as a result of your attempts to train it, if you're not, you can be so focused on the goal, I've, I've got to get to single pointedness, that you don't notice any of the stuff that's unfolding in front of you. But if you're open to noticing it, then uh, all, all of the most profound insights that you could uh, wish to uh, have revealed to you are, are, are being presented to you in, in this process. And more often than not, in the parts of the process that you would otherwise regard as where you're having difficulties. You know, right from the very beginning, when you find that I am not a, 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 a uni, unified being with a single thing called a mind, because one part of, you know, one part of your mind wants to do one thing, and, and for a while that's the self, and uh, there's these other things resisting it, but the self is going to conquer, and then later on you find the self hat switched to one of these other ones, and, and the self really wants to go and, you know, uh, have a cup of coffee and go for a walk. Right? <laughs> And then there's <laughs> this other idea that's getting in the way of that, that you need to sit here and finish your, your meditation. So, I don't know if I've expressed this very well, but all of the wonderful discoveries that you want to discover are right there in front of you. And when you're meditating, if, if you don't forget to look, you, you, can, you can find them. That's a help. I always wondered what these insights were. <laughs> I just kept hearing about insights, yeah. insights, insights. Yeah. Well, yes. Insights, you know, they... <laughs> and I didn't know yeah. really what they were, you know, what, what the nature of them was. I asked Brian that question one time in the class. <laughs> Remember I, I, I asked... I told her she should ask you. <laughs> 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 well, these these are the insights, you know, that um, basically that there are no such things as things. There is only a continuous flux of sensation and the stories that our mind makes up to account for sensations, you know, and. There's, uh, and the real, the other important thing to ask about these insights is, so how do they help? Right? So when we say that your mind makes up stories to account for the sensations, now that is true at the level, at, a, at, a, at the most fundamental level of you know things like the other day we talked about rocks or, or this bowl or things like that. But that is not, although that's totally true, that's not all that important. It doesn't matter that much that the only reason I perceive this as a thing with a particular nature and qualities is because uh, my mind projects it. Because that's a pretty useful projection, and all of our minds are going to make a similar projection when they encounter the same kind of sensations arising. But it's when we realize that as soon as things become, they, they, they uh, come to a higher level of complexity, then the emptiness has profound significance. No two of us perceive anything at the complex level, at, at the qualitative level, in the same way. You know, for some, this is beautiful, for some this is ugly, for some this is useful, you know, for some this is something I'd really like to have, uh, you know, it, uh, 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 all of a sudden, and then, well, where you really can appreciate the absolute emptiness is in uh, our perception of ourselves and of people, because You know, I, we think we, you and I think we know each other, but all I know is a projection in my mind of Allegra. And you have a completely different projection in your mind of Allegra. But even your projection, we, we can't even say that your projection in your mind of Allegra is the real Allegra, can we? As a matter of fact, 
what happens when you see your reflection in a mirror or a window unexpectedly? Do you see exactly what you expect to see? Or are you surprised? But what I'm what I'm thinking about, I mean, we we have I, I think we understand that intellectually, but what's the difference? An insight yes. gives you a different understanding. Yeah. I mean, we've talked this over and over a hundred million times yeah. of the pen and the yeah. you, you It's experiential. It's oh, it's ma- it's right. when it comes real through direct experience. That's where it becomes. Because until that time, it's just an idea. Right. And if you forget, forget if you forget to process the information analytically, you don't have the idea. You know, uh, we can sit here and say all the same things we always have about emptiness, and then turn around an hour from now, and in a real life situation, uh, we'll be captured by appearances, and we'll totally forget the emptiness. Right. And that's that's because the only way you can know the emptiness uh, at that level is to to have those intellectual discursive thought processes identify it. And in fact, it's just another. It's not the real emptiness. It's only another conceptual formation. Anyway, it's not real emptiness. So you you've got to start experiencing it in uh, in a variety of different ways. But when when it happens uh, in, in a directly experiential way, then you don't forget it. It becomes a part of your worldview, and that's as a matter of fact. That's why in the vipassana practice, uh, purification of view is the absolute first stage of, of insight, followed by purification by overcoming doubt, which is where. <laughs> You take the experience, the direct experience in your meditation, and it be, it becomes a part of your intuitive understanding of things, so that you you no longer, you know, uh, yes, it it seems that way, but you know, you're not you're not really convinced, or you doubt. I know for her that. Hmm? I'm glad I finally figured out what the site was. <laughs> well, it's, it's time to do a sit. Uh, I, I probably talked enough for tonight. I hope what we've talked about is helpful to you in your practice. And uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to go check on my mother before she goes to sleep, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say good night to you now and have uh, have a wonderful night, and you can meditate until the bell rings at 9 o'clock and then decide to go to bed.